Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious today with John Weaver. John Weaver, we're in mission control. He is a veteran Marine. Ura was a Marine with Marty, our co-producer and my friend here. And uh, we're going to have a great show talking to John about his career with NASA as a contractor on the Apollo and shuttle area. So welcome, John. Thank you, Mark. And Great uh, to be here. Well, thank you for your service to our country. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and uh, how you got to, to meet this uh, Marty Winkle character. <laughs> well, Marty and I met uh, in the Marine Corps. Uh, Hoorah! It was in 1962 at Jacksonville, the Naval Air Technical Training Center. And uh, we got to know each other pretty well, both on and off the base. Uh, we, uh, I have a story I'll relate later on about. Okay. Uh, we want the well, good story. Yeah, well, you ended up uh, being Marty's boss. So we also want to know what kind of a good employee he was. <laughs> and my boss's boss. Oh, he's your boss's boss. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. And, of course, we got Trekkie Techie Jessica Galloway uh, behind the computer there helping us. Uh, look at this beautiful scene behind you here, John. Uh, the uh, launch control that you're very familiar with. You're talking to the director of the launch process services during the shuttle era. LPS was an acronym that kind of took me a while to is get a hold of. Services or systems? Did I mess it up? Systems. Okay. Ah. All right. I didn't mess it up. I, I messed, messed it up, it of course, <laughs> on there. And uh, uh, John, we want you to know that uh, oral histories and conversations like this are important to our nonprofit museum uh, because of course, we preserve the birth of the American space age and inspire the next generation with your stories and others. And this oral history is made possible by the Marie Louise G. West Endowment that gave us $5,000 to continue oral histories like this. And we could buy some wonderful equipment to reach out to our Stay Curious listeners uh, all over the world. We've got uh, uh, Dave Pirelli's in Connecticut. We've got Scott Polk in Hobart, uh, Australia. Of course, Robert Law is in Dundee, Scotland, enjoying his scotch right now on a big screen wow. uh, TV because we're on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Uh, Dave watching and, on YouTube. Uh, Dave's watching on YouTube. 60-year-old Dave staying up there in Michigan. Uh, just going to be a couple weeks, Dave, and that team up north is going to get their lesson from my Buckeyes. So uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today talking with John Weaver. Uh, about his career. He's, he worked a little bit on the instrument unit on the Saturn V rocket. And then uh, all this stuff behind the scenes of launching a shuttle rocket is what John Weaver and Marty Winkle did in the launch process services world. But uh, uh, John, before we crank it up here a minute, we love space history and we love the fact that uh, uh, we have space history to talk about almost every day, and today in 1966, on November 11th, was the final flight of the six, 10 missions of Gemini that uh, did a lot of things we needed to do to go to the moon, rendezvous docking, test a, a, a space suit, and find out if we could live uh, a week in space to go to the moon and back. And uh, you came on right after these missions, didn't you, John? I did. I came on in uh, January of 67, mm -hmm. right before the uh, Apollo 1 fire Okay. 34. And we'll talk about uh, that maybe a little bit here, but wanted to know that our uh, uh, Gemini 12 heroes here uh, on the left is Buzz Aldrin, and Buzz is 91 years old, and that's Jim Lovell on the right, and he's 93 years old. Mark, look at those cameras. Yeah, I look. They got, the, they got some souped-up cameras there. The main mission of this was to test the spacesuit uh, that uh, uh, they'd had trouble with uh, because of overheating. They didn't understand that the exertion was so much out there and the weightlessness. And Buzz Aldrin says, we need to train in a water tank like a scuba diver. Mm -hmm. And that was a revelation that came on on this mission. Very successful mission. Uh, here's a picture of Buzz. He also took the first selfie in space of himself with the camera. You don't see this picture much of his spacewalk. And uh, oh, we that's all right, but this we didn't get this turned around. This is our space view park, folks. Uh, sideways, is this? I'm laying on the ground, and we've got pavers there. You don't need to mess with that, Jessica, unless 
Uh, but I might be able to fix it real quick. Uh, we have, uh, we're so proud of our monuments at Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. They celebrate the space workers. Just let me go to the next one there. I think it's turn two. Okay. Uh, yep, it is. You have these pylons there that are the number two for the two Gemini program, Buzz, and then special to me, it's like Taj Mahal special to it me, okay? One, no. one of a kind thing. All right, thank you, Jessica. Yeah, there's gives you an idea going up to the Indian River. The VAB is in the background there. We saw a beautiful launch last night. Uh, uh, I posted a picture of the launch of our Crew 3 uh, just to the right of that two there. So uh, thank you, Jessica, for correcting that. There's Jim Lovell's handprints there, okay? Uh, still a little rain in his thumbs there and, and fingers from uh, the night's rain there. Not a Florida but, day. Uh, but I, no. <laughs> but uh, 93 years old, and uh, Marty Winkle, of course, is part of the Grumman Lunar Module team, and, and uh, they've been in contact with all these astronauts over the years at their reunions and so forth, and they hope to get... Uh, uh, Jim Lovell at the uh, the next uh, reunion in there. So, Other way. Uh, all right. Uh, so G GT12, very important. We want to remember that uh, mission. And uh, I guess we're not going to have the, uh, when the shuttle pops up there, we'll, maybe that's the next one. Nope. Okay. We're also celebrating the launch of the STS-5, the first operational shuttle mission. And uh, those pictures will be in here somewhere. Uh, because we're getting this program together here, uh, not knowing uh, until 24 hours ago that John was going to be with us. I told Marty I wanted a veteran uh, on the, our Veterans Memorial today. And uh, so uh, his Marine buddy, John, agreed to show up here today. So, uh, John, here is the Launch Control Center next to the VAB at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, one of your workplaces, I imagine. I think your shuttle pictures are after two firing room pictures. Okay, all right. Tell us first, where'd you grow up? Uh, did you think you were going to get into this business when you were a, a teenager? And uh, how'd that all happen? Well, <clears throat> I actually grew up in Central Florida in a little town called Winter Haven. Uh, and I really had no idea that I would end up uh, on the East Coast, on the Space Coast, except that uh, the day John Glenn was launched, they let us come out of the classroom uh, in high school and stand out in awe of that launch. And uh, we could actually see it from some 100 miles away. February 20th, 1962. Mm. Now, I was eight years old living in winter park okay <laughs> uh and um uh and my dad was a champion go-kart racer and invested in checker go-kart track i need okay. to research that someday so we were down here for a, a couple years but i woke up with the mumps and my mom and i saw walter cronkite talk about it going up and we walked out in the backyard and i remember seeing that single stick rocket go up mm -hmm. uh just about like you did the only launch I ever saw until I saw a uh, Falcon 9 because I came down for a couple shuttles. But that's interesting. You and I shared the same uh, launch there. Uh, uh, <laughs> first uh, first launch, yes. Interesting. Uh, that's cool. I love stuff like that. Uh, so where'd you go to school? How'd you get uh, into this uh, business? Went to, went to school in uh, Winter Haven, Winter Haven High School. Was not a stellar student by any means. And... Uh, when graduation rolled around, my dad called me in and said, uh, well, what do you intend to do? And I said, uh, well, I guess I'll go to school like everyone else is. And he said, not on my watch. You didn't study when you were in high school. There's no reason to believe you're going to study uh, if I send you to college. So you need to figure tough love here. You need to figure out what you're going to do. And... Uh, Get on with it because I want you out of the house within the next two weeks. Holy cow! So that I is said, the oh, tough love. Uh, I need to take this to the next higher authority. <laughs> Your mom. So I went to my mom, <laughs> and I should have known they talked this out. She said, <laughs> "Well, you need inside. you need to listen to him. Oh, he uh, this is his house. You need to figure out what you're going to do." And I said, "Well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do." She said, "Well, you need to think about the military." Uh, and I said, okay, they have uh, some recruiters coming to the school over the next couple of weeks. I'll do that. 
And lo and behold, the Marine Corps recruiter convinced me that's what I wanted to do. So I went off, uh, joined the Marines, went to Paris Island, and Marty and I had an opportunity to go back there 25 years after that mm. and review the troops. Uh, it was, uh, I would not trade that experience for anything because it gave an undisciplined young man uh, a path. And uh, from there, uh, Marty and I spent uh, several reunions in the Corps. We kept crossing paths, and not only in the Corps, but afterwards in the space program. We inadvertently crossed paths, and we decided there must be something to this relationship, this friendship, because we uh, found one another at least a half a dozen times over the years. Hmm. And in fact, when uh, the Apollo program ended with, uh, with uh, the uh, Russian joint mission, mm -hmm. I had a job offer to go to uh, Austin, Texas. And Marty said, don't you take that job offer I do not want to move to Texas. <laughs> Is that right? That sounds like Marty. Yeah. Well, a loyal friend for sure, uh, Marty is. You guys have been friends all that time. Did you, you said you had a special story. Well, yes. After uh, when I left the Marine Corps, I uh, took a job with a company that was providing equipment for us in the Corps. Uh, and this was in early 67 uh, snowstorm time in Chicago mm -hmm. and I told my wife uh, I'm done with the Midwest it's just too cold you don't have to uh, you don't have to be retired to live in Florida <laughs> so we came to Florida and my new philosophy I love it and while uh, we stayed with my parents and while we were there Oh, Dad uh, let you back in the house, huh? Yeah. He let me back in the house, yes. Actually, he really changed his tone later on because I, I got some uh, character. He's uh, proud of his Marine boy, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I would recommend that career path for any young person. Uh, really helped you get your head screwed on right. While we were with them uh, looking for employment, I was going through the wanted ads in the local newspaper and we had a small dog and it was another unflorida like day raining outside <laughs> and uh, the dog was uh, whining crossing its legs needed to go out uh, so i took the newspaper and spread it out on the floor and as the puddle grew on the newspaper i read the help wanted ads for ibm at Cape Kennedy. Oh, Cape really? Kennedy. And I had to write down the number and couldn't Story couldn't out. tear it out. Yeah, Story really, out. on the very paper that the dog was wetting, right. you, you took the job uh, at one end. Wow. Yeah, called them, come on over, uh, sat down with them, and uh, ended up going to work in ground electrical systems. Uh huh. And uh, my first assignment was on Complex 34. Uh, on Apollo 1, and uh, uh, that was a very traumatic moment. Uh, the Apollo 1 fire. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. You have some, I mean, it's hard to relive those memories uh, we have with so many people, uh, like Ernie Rios. Do you, you know Ernie? I know Ernie well. Yeah, yes. uh, Ernie passed away a, about a year ago. Yeah. And uh, he's a, been a good Quality. friend of the museum. He told some stories about that. But uh, yeah. uh, what 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 would you like to comment about the Apollo One? Well, I remember the, I was I was a raw recruit, console jockey, uh, trainee, with uh, another engineer on station, and uh, they uh, as soon as the fire happened. The agency secured, had security to cure the blockhouse. And we sat there for the next couple of hours before we were debriefed and told 
obviously not to talk to the press. You can't have 30 or 40 different stories mm-hmm. being told to the press. And shortly after that, uh, we, we were all required to give written statements uh, and then reassigned. And I was reassigned to uh, uh, the main complex, Pad A, uh, on Complex 39. And uh, Marty and I's path crossed again. I was up working the uh, the IU, and Marty was uh, up on the... It, the instrument unit is below. You got the, the, the rescue tower up here and the command module. The lunar module is in that tapered area. They call the slaw, right? Mm-hmm. Right, Marty, the slaw? And uh, below that is a, is a black... A band around there that is the instrument unit that Werner von Braun called the most important stage of the Saturn V rocket. Mm-hmm. It had all the computer for the avionics and engine uh, th- thrusts and stuff in there. The brains. The brains, yeah, the brains on there. And so you were working on the brains down here, and Marty was up above working on the brawn. Mm-hmm. Is that the way it was up there <laughs> yeah. in the lunar module up there? Yeah. And that was, uh, uh, of course, you worked on the IU, the instrument unit on the ground some but when marty was up there that was what 300 and how many feet 320 feet Hmm. did you have to get in the iu up there on the the stack uh the uh the iu had a separate uh swing arm for access oh obviously then right yeah when you you get to the iu to the to the left Mm. yes if you wanted to go inside yes wow and that's what blows my mind is that while while it's out there on the pad, they're still working on it. You thought all the work was done in the VAB. Okay, let's haul it out there and light the candle. No, you were out there for a couple of weeks, right, Marty and, and John working on? Three about three months. Here at the American Space Museum, John Weaver uh, and his uh, Marine buddy, Marty Winkle, are, of course, our co-producer and, and uh, has helped us with this program uh, immeasurably over the last year and a half to help you all stay curious. And uh, these oral, um, the, uh, you worked all the Apollo era there. And uh, what, uh, you know, uh, what, what, which mission sticks out? Obviously probably Apollo 11, all that work put in there, but what, 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 what got your gut or your heart through those uh, 17 missions to the moon and back? Not 17 missions to the moon and back, but through Apollo 17. Uh, I think it was 10 missions to the moon and back during the era. Well, I, I think everyone probably remembers Apollo 13. Uh, that was a pretty gut-wrenching uh, time. Uh, as a matter of fact, Fred Hayes lived here in Titusville for a number of years. And uh, I, I do run across Fred from time to time. I think... Uh, Marty was trying to organize a uh, an Apollo 13 reunion here not long ago. They've been re- they've been trying to get the 50th reunion together for about a year and a half here because of the COVID situation and uh, September 29th. January. Oh, January 29th now. Yeah, January 29th. They're going to finally have it. Um, uh, yeah, Fred Hayes, what a wonderful human being that I've met, had the privilege to meet. He supported our museum. Good man. He's uh, he's uh, friends with uh, who I call our godfather, Charlie Mars. You yes. know Charlie. Yes. And uh, he got a uh, John got a big warm hug from Karen Conklin, our executive director here. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, you know, fifty years later, I know you don't. I mean, I'm at the age where I don't like thinking back too far anymore. But you lived it half a century ago. And now you see what's going on. We never went back. Uh, you know, everyone's got their own opinions about that. But uh, we are going back. And, uh, you know, things are in motion with the Artemis program. But as you reflect on that sometimes and look at that beautiful moon that's in the sky tonight. Mm-hmm. All right. And the planet Jupiter is going to be right below it, gang. What, what, what stirs in, 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 in your, your memories? Uh, the thing that I reflect on is looking back i would not want to uh, to change a thing i think the agency has been largely very well managed 
throughout from program to program. Uh, there's certainly been some hardships, but uh, the NASA people in general uh, are the best. And the contractors, uh, they are the best. The relationship between the agency and the contractors, I think it's even today, if you look at what is happening with the agency backing out from the day-to-day uh, -day operations more and more and turning that over to uh, private contractors. That's what happened in with aviation in mm -hmm. general. Uh, that's, that's the right road. Uh, and I have to focus on research and development and uh, long-term space exploration is is the right path in my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, to speak of that management and so forth and the whole NASA uh, culture, if you will, and it is a culture, um, a big safety culture, by the way, that I've learned, you know, uh, is, is, is foremost. Is John, though you retired before the end of the shuttle era, uh, the fact that they, they, they did the, after everyone knew they were going to lose their jobs and the last three missions were some of the best missions they ever flew, everybody had pride in their work to the very end. And, and I think it goes to what you speak of, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the whole culture of NASA, uh, you know, put your personal problems and opinions aside where right. we have to, uh, because it's dangerous business, right? You can't underestimate the danger involved here. And and we have a local boy in charge of the agency, Bill Nelson. Right. He grew up in Melbourne. Uh, yep. Astronaut. Yep. Yep. Excellent, excellent choice. Well, uh, well the politician uh, did a lot for, of course, for the Space yep. Coast here throughout his uh, and uh, yeah, Bill Nelson and uh, Pam uh, uh, Mallory is our assistant director, and Bob Cabana is third in charge. Mm -hmm. And we feel like the with those uh, three awesome people in charge, uh, we will get to the moon. What, what do you That's think it. about Artemis? Just to throw that out there. Uh, uh, besides, like me, hoping you live long enough to to see it and uh, us on the moon again. I I used to tell my wife when we had delays in program uh, there will be no launch before it's time okay and it's <laughs> time when uh, the minds all agree that everybody can give a thumbs up uh, without any reservation mm -hmm. and uh, we've had delays in Artemis obviously uh, but they're necessary do it right that's right or stay home well uh, it's dangerous. We saw a beautiful launch last night. Four more astronauts go to space, including uh, two rookies uh, and uh, three rookies and a woman. Uh, no, we don't have it because they brought back the uh, we, we were hoping we'd have a total of 14 humans in space, but they brought the crew two back early. So you just have the seven on the space station. I think they're docking this tonight about seven o'clock and they'll get in about nine. But we got three. Cause we have three uh, astronaut Chinese astronauts in space, and mm -hmm. they did the first female spacewalk of China yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got two more sections of their space station ready to launch up there. Uh, China is not messing around, as you well know, as you read in the news. They are escalating their space program. They got a rover on Mars. They got they brought back four pounds of dirt from the moon back in May, and they're building a new fabulous space station. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, John? Well, I think international competition, uh, we would not be where we are today had we not had the competition with the Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a positive thing to, uh, to help push one another. Okay. Space race. A space race. And is this sort of a new space race and definitely a renaissance here on, on the rocket? Uh, you know, I didn't ask you this uh, off camera before we started this, but you know your good friend Marty there uh, will run 26 miles just to 
uh, go uh, so he can eat a, a, a pint of Hagen Das. All right. Uh, uh, Hagen Das, okay. Uh, not a pint, a quart, actually, uh, in there. Uh, were you a runner? Were you, did he get you involved in that, John? I, he did, but I was not an avid runner. Uh, and matter of fact, Marty and I used to have this uh, contest where I would say, Marty, you only get so many heartbeats in life, and you're <laughs> burning yours up rapidly. <laughs> he is. Of course, we're talking uh, about you marathon runners out there, and Marty has been involved in that all of his life. And it's amazing all the astronauts that uh, he's turned me on to that were involved in that. Lauren Schreiber and Mike McCulley. Uh, uh, who? Musgrave. Musgrave. Yeah, Story Musgrave. Uh, all that, and it's a good, fun thing. Uh, something that's not my cup of tea, uh, but uh, 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 but anyway, had to, had to get that in there as I was thinking about. It. Well, we're talking to John Weaver here, and we're going to look at uh, uh, the next uh, group of pictures I have here. Yeah, there's our STS five boys there. Uh, uh, there's the launch. Thank you, Tom Usiak. He's in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. A friend of our museum took that photograph. Uh, in 1982, the fifth launch of a space shuttle, the fifth time Columbia had gone to space uh, uh, at 7.19 a.m. on November 11th. Vance Brand, here's our crew. Uh, let's look at Vance, there's on the right. He's 89 years old today. He was the commander having flown on the Apollo-Soyuz test project in July 75, so he waited seven more years to fly and be a commander. Uh, all the other ones, this is the first time we flew four people in space, by the way. And uh, beside him is uh, uh, Robert Overmeyer. And Robert Overmeyer uh, died uh, uh, about 10 years ago. We have his flight jacket here at the museum. Uh, he was the pilot. A mission specialist there was uh, Bill Lenore, and he's passed away. But Joseph Allen there, 84 today, he was a mission specialist. And uh, he did the spacewalk on 51A 37 years ago on this date in history. So he was twice in space uh, on November 11th. Uh, and he had that stinger and the MMU that went out there and captured a, a, a spacecraft, and, uh, which was just an amazing thing at the time. And uh, John, we talk about the early days of the shuttle like this. It was gonna be a space truck. Uh, NASA said, forget your single stick rockets. Uh, we've got John Weaver and Marty Winkle going to launch all your satellites for you. Uh, and then, of course, we had that bad day in January after 25 launches. But tell me about the enthusiasm as you're walking into the, the launch uh, of, of STS-1 and, 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 and all the other ones that followed there. I know STS-1 is very special to you, but tell me about the, the concept that this was going to be our space truck. Well... Early on, I don't think there was the appreciation for just how sophisticated and complex uh, the vehicle was. Mm -hmm. uh, between the orbiter, the SRBs, and the external tank, uh, just the ground systems that had to interface with the vehicle were extremely complicated. Uh, obviously not designed for flight, but uh, very complex. And we saw early on that the number of employees that would be required to process the truck uh, between missions were uh, grossly underestimated. Uh, requirements for uh, maintenance and uh, advancement of the onboard systems uh, drove the workforce, the the tile operations were uh, over the top mm -hmm. uh, early on in the program. The uh, the ground systems they used to accuse us, they <laughs> the outsiders accused us of having a standing army 
of workers, uh, and indeed we did because it was necessary. Uh, later on, we uh, began to refine the processes and uh, better define the processes. In the launch processing system, for example, uh, early on in the program, uh, there were probably at the peak about a thousand people writing software. This is ground software. The flight software was the onboard software was written by IBM and JSC. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the ground software were written by NASA and contractor engineers at KSC. Uh, once those early programs were established, uh, we were able to get into a, uh, uh, a mode of maintaining the software, but that was well into the program, probably SDS 25 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of hardware and software in the ground systems was more than anyone ever imagined. It would be. Hmm. Well, of course, you know Bob Seek, the great launch director. I'm sure he's a good friend of yours. We didn't talk about Bob, but he's been he's obviously a great friend of our museum, was our treasurer. Bob's been on our Stay Curious program a couple times. And uh, Bob emphasizes that, uh, yes, we put a, a reusable spacecraft in orbit and all that, but just what you're talking about, John. Bob Seek says the real and 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 all these pieces and parts and, and contractors and so forth coming together, and uh, 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 do you agree with Bob about that? I do, uh, they, and I, I credit the NASA leadership at that time for recognizing uh, who they needed in charge and not only within the agency, within the contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob and his team, uh, everyone felt obligated to do their best for the program because of people like Bob being in charge. Bob and Charlie. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Mars ran the project office, the NASA project office mm -hmm. at KSC for years and years. Uh, and Bob was once a member of that project office, left and became the launch director. Uh, just a, an excellent management team and the leadership coalescing. I, I, I don't know of how the agency could have done a better job of bringing the team together that they did. Hmm. You yeah. concur with that, Marty Winkle? He's had a good experience that. You know, Bob Seek told me something one time that I'll never forget, John. He said, if you like what you do and it doesn't feel like work, you must be in the right place. Mm -hmm. And Bob said that's how he felt his whole NASA career, except for, of course, those few days that everybody knows were the bad ones. Right. How uh, about you? Do you feel like uh, my uh, military service as well as my service to the agency? I would, if I could do it over again, I would do it again. Well, anyway. we're talking with John Weaver, a proud uh, Marine veteran, URA with Marty Winkle. They were Marines together, and you know what? Uh, if I could change something in my life, John and Marty. Um, that would be, I would have gone in service. I was, wasn't from a service oriented family, but when I got older and saw what it's done and, and, you know, I, I kind of regret that I didn't, uh, I was in the last, next to the last Vietnam draft. So it wasn't a very popular thing to do at the time, but hell I'd have been a reporter or photographer or something, you know, in there, but no, I understand the discipline and, and all that, that, that I'll admit I, I could have used. Uh, uh, back back in the day doing some things there. Well, we are in the delivery room of America's Space Age here in Brevard County, and I love putting it that way, John, because you were one of the 
the the uh, technicians, the doctors, the orderlies, the, the that are that were at the Cape over there, uh, launching the missions here in our wonderful county. And here is a poster that you brought in uh, of you through the years there. And uh, though we can't see things real close up there, these are meaningful things to like you and Marty to remember your friends and 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 what you did. Correct. Mm. Well, Marty and I were reunited when we both worked for Rockwell. Rock, uh, Marty was a uh, DPS engineer. Uh huh. And uh, I was right across the hall, software engineer, and we bumped into one another by accident again. And uh, we left Rockwell in. What year, Marty? I went to Lockheed. 83? 83. Yeah. yeah. NASA recompeted the uh, uh, shuttle processing contract. We Lockheed. Lockheed came to us. What? No, that's how it works. <laughs> Ethan, you didn't go to Lockheed. Lockheed went to you. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, Lockheed did a very commendable job in transition. Uh, there was a lot of cooperation between Rockwell and Lockheed in that time frame. And uh, they, the two companies along with the agency helped make that transition a success. And that was around the FCS 10 time frame, mm -hmm. if I remember. Uh, and then shortly, shortly, I say, what year did uh, we move to United Space Alliance? Marty. Uh, Come on, Marty. Pop quiz. USA was probably like in the ST. Uh, ULA? Uh, right, right. Uh, you, uh, no. You should talk about the United Space Alliance. Right. Not sure when that was. I'd say it was right around 1999. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to look. I don't have it on my scroll here, <laughs> there. I was kind of consulting the, consulting the scroll there, but uh, uh, well, we wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the control rooms there, John. Uh, and uh, let me uh, here is well, I brought this cockpit of the glass cockpit in here, mm. just to kind of emphasize to our readers, our, our readers, our stay curious people here, that um, you're at the launch control that we're behind here. All right. And some of what you're doing is translating in here, all right. Mm -hmm. Of course, once the bird leaves the the tower, your your job's done, right? Well, uh, the uh, the concept was there was a handoff of uh, uh, responsibility at the time the shuttle cleared the tower. It would move from KSC to JSC. Uh, in terms of translating, uh, all of the ground system were constantly monitoring not only the flight hardware, but the, the ground systems that were servicing the, the vehicle. And that was a very unique computer concept at the time. It was probably one of the first, if not the first, operational local area network that uh, was used as a command and control system uh, for the first time. And during Apollo, everything was hardwired. It was all toggle switches, meters. Uh, the launch processing system was a NASA-designed digital approach to uh processing the vehicle all of the instrumentation on board the vehicle was monitored in the control room mm -hmm. uh, quite a unique concept for its time uh, the computer geeks out there will probably appreciate the uh, concept was that's jessica over there to tie uh, hardware interface modules to 
the flight hardware as well as the, the ground systems. Most of the flight hardware, hardware was handled via downlink as opposed to any real hardware interface. Mm -hmm. And the hardware interface modules uh, interfaced with front-end processors, which were computers that initially looked at the, the data and fed into the control room into a common data buffer where each of the systems engineers that were responsible for all the onboard and ground systems could look at the same data uh, and uh, we had a ground launch sequencer that also had parameters that were defined by the design agency that uh, you had to be within a certain spec mm -hmm. before you got a, a go for launch. And it was designed by IBM did software and Martin Marietta did the hardware. Uh, it was uh, the precursor to many, many lands that exist today. Hmm. There's so many spinoffs from, from our, our program here. Here we're looking at uh, the STS-120 uh, control room there. Uh, is that Would that be firing room four? Uh, uh, Marty, what, or that's firing room, room one? one? Okay. Yeah. One. Uh, and you've seen over the years how these have gotten more streamlined, more more computers have gotten smaller here at the American Space Museum here that we're proudly showing off there. Um, some of that was used in, yeah, in those that control was, rooms. That was some of the actual hardware. Yeah, the, uh, the fueling of the station. and There is a, a gentleman that uh, has done a good deal for the museum by the name of Warren Lackey. Oh, absolutely, Warren Lackey. Warren, Warren had the vision that all of this complicated uh, hardware that we had to uh, and software could be uh, captured on a personal computer, a laptop. Really? And uh, he introduced what we what he called. PC GOAL. GOAL was an acronym, Ground Operations Aerospace Language, that all of our application software was written in to process the vehicle. And Warren, uh, with a couple of other fellows, managed to port uh, most of that capability onto personal computers, and that enabled the next generation of uh, computer, ground computer systems to uh, evolve into what we have today. Hmm. Uh, Warren Lackey is a, 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 he will be on Stay Curious one day. I've just made a note of that. We were going to get him on during the pandemic time and that didn't work out. He is a wonderful caretaker of our Space View Park. He, uh, he etched all those things out there on the shuttle in his garage, I understand, and he takes care of any kind of fix-it-up things out there. Warren Lackey, we'll, we'll have you on Stay Curious here. What we're looking at here is what is now called, the. this is the Artemis, or Space Launch System Control Room, and they have renamed it the Young Crippen uh, Control Room after, of course, the, the late John Young, Orlando native, and Bob Crippen. I think Cripp's about 84 years old in there and you and marty both before the the when we were talking about some of your favorite missions without a doubt mm. the first launch 30 yes, years yes. or 40 years ago april of the reusable trans, space transportation system the first launch of columbia april 12th uh tell us a little about about that and how uh where was your uh, uh heart fluttering in your throat or in your shoes or a traumatic day for everybody but uh Everyone was on edge for, for certain. Uh, two gentlemen, uh, George Page. Oh, yes, George Page. Great. And uh, Tom O'Malley mm -hmm. were at the helm at that time. And uh, they brought calm, 
and sanity to the team in my mind. Mm. They, uh, they could sense the tension and uh, they were the relief valves for the team. Hmm. George Page, uh, uh, both the great uh, names of space history uh, uh, from the Mercury program on Tom O'Malley pushed the button that launched John Glenn. And we have that button in our Mercury Gemini gallery in there. And uh, uh, actually, uh, he is buried out there at pad 14. 14. Yeah, 14. I, uh, I understand. Uh, and uh, Marty showed me a little plaque that's out there of him out there. Uh, and George Page, I've, I've read up a lot on there. And an interesting observation here, uh, uh, you're a rather tall gentleman, and I know that both these guys were big men, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, but they, they had that gentle touch, it seemed, like, like you're saying, the observation of things. Rocco Patron, another uh, uh, big man out there, which I understand they're going to rename, uh, uh, we heard yesterday they're finally going to rename one of the launch process and something after, after Rocco Patron, you guys know about that? But tell us about the Rocco also, you know, you, you know these guys, you work with these guys. Uh, yeah. Rocco Patron uh, was a disciplinarian. Uh, when Rocco came to the pad, uh, you knew it. <laughs> uh, things just, he kept things crisp. Okay. And, and one particular story I can tell, he was uh, doing a vehicle inspection, a walk down uh, on the Saturn, and uh, he was out on the arm, and we always had a problem with insects at the pad, wasps in particular. Really? Okay. And... Uh, Rocco, everyone wore hard hats, uh, except when you were in the vehicle. And Rocco was coming across the pad, and one of the quality inspectors walked over to Rocco Patron, NASA dignitary, and lowered the boom on him, swung his hand down, hit Rocco right on top of the head, drove his helmet down around his ears he looked like a world war one doughboy <laughs> and he said wasp <laughs> on top of his helmet landed on rocco's helm and rocco looked at him and said thank you <laughs> and his helmet. oh my god well that's a funny story about rocco one story i heard about him john was uh after a, a, a briefing of a whatever kind of test was going on uh, a junior, he asked a junior executive a question, junior engineer about something, and the junior engineer just fed him a bunch of BS. Mm. Rocco fired him on the spot and says, "You don't BS me." Mm. Uh, uh, he was like that, wasn't he? He was. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, and you know, uh, John Tribe. Of course, John Maybe. Tribe was called in front of the carpet of Rocco Patron for his hypergolic to Rocco's office. There was one chair in front of Rocco's desk, and the wall was lined with all the other chairs in there. <laughs> and said, Mr. Uh, you think we would have done it without these two, these personalities like this gone to the moon, John? Uh, Rocco Patron, uh, 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 George Page, and Tom O'Malley, uh, three just stellar leaders of this whole uh, moon race against uh, uh, the Soviet Union? They were at the right place at the right time. You know, I, in my mind, would we have uh, won our world wars without the leadership we had being in the right place at the right time? Mm -hmm. Good. I I have no, no reservations about the... Uh, uh, Tom or George or Rocco, they were uh, they were good men, and they're well thought of in history of, of our of our marvelous American space age, which again, uh, born right here in Brevard County, uh, the only place in the world where we've launched humans to the moon, and uh, we never want to forget about that. But we're enjoying our conversation here with John Weaver, uh, brought to you in part by the Louise West Endowment, uh, Marie Louise G. West Endowment. Uh, the daughters, Laura West and Charlotte West Petenpole, uh, we're so grateful for them for 
uh, wanting to help us out to be able to do wonderful conversations like this with John Weaver, who worked on the Apollo era, and then uh, former director of launch process services in the shuttle era. Very important job with a lot of responsibilities. Tell your friends to rewatch this on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Twitch. Like, share, subscribe, follow. Uh, we need uh, uh, we, we, we need watch minutes up on YouTube uh, to help our nonprofit monetize these oral histories here. But you're enjoying them for free, and we're glad that you are. And uh, we uh, certainly uh, thank you for your service to our country, John. I'm looking at here. Did we have any other pictures we wanted to show up there in our gallery? Let me just look real quick. We want to shout out a happy Veterans Day here on this November 11th, 2021. Uh, we couldn't celebrate it the way we usually do last year, but I saw some good, uh, uh, a nice little ceremony at the Veterans uh, Marine Veterans. Is there something I haven't asked you that you'd like to share about your career? Uh, I I would like to say that if there are any young people watching today that are seriously considering a career in the space industry, go for it. You won't find a better group of people or environment anywhere in America. And that's from a gentleman who knows John Weaver. Thank you so much, sir, for you, for uh, yeah. for uh, your service to our country and putting up with Marty Winkle for uh, six decades. Jeez, you need a medal for that, I'll tell you. And uh, uh, right, I am. He. Oh, okay. You put up with him, huh? Okay. Uh, but it's always a pleasure to get to know men and women like you, John. That's what makes. Uh, uh, this is such a special place here at the American Space Museum. Please don't be a stranger, and uh, we will welcome you back here anytime. And uh, uh, with that, I'm going to thank everybody. We have a great uh, 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 show lined up for you tomorrow. All right, though it is Triple T's Tales from the White Room, we're going to bring to you a European Space Agency. Capcom controller that was uh, talks to the European Space Agency astronauts on the ISS. He was here for yesterday's launch, and we're going to have two launch photographers here. Mark Usiak's going to be in the house, all right, with Carlton Bale. And we can't wait to have a roundtable talk tomorrow, probably like you're never going to see the likes of again mm. uh, here on Stay Curious. But again, thank you, John Weaver, uh, Marty Winkle, and J Jessica Galloway for all you do behind the scenes. And until tomorrow, I'm Mark Marquette, and we'll see you to bridge the space between us.